Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about global diversity. When does global diversity stop growing? We need to consider environmental, political, religious, geographical, social factors. Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our guests for the show are Manfred Henningsen, Emeritus Professor, Political Philosophy, UH Manoa, and Sandra Sims, author and former Hawaii State Judge. Welcome to the show, all of you. We live in a world where DEI is um, certainly a term of art now in the political parlance in the United States, given this election. Uh, we live in a, in a time when migrants have come from the Middle East and North Africa into Europe, and there's all kinds of reactions to that. Um, and the world is changing because of either diversity or the possibility of diversity. Uh, and, and we have to look forward on it. Now, there's Samuel Huntington, who says that, um, you know, we have a clash of civilizations. And his nuance on that is the clash is cultural rather than geographical. But who knows what you guys will say about that. And it goes to the perfectibility of humankind, uh, Locke and Hobbes, and, and actually a, a student of Huntington, namely Francis Fukuyama, uh, also from the Ivy League, uh, who believes it's all going to work out great. Give it a few years and uh, there'll be a, 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 a merging of the cultures from all around the world. Very optimistic. So let's talk about optimism. Manfred, you know, do you think that we have a clash of cultures going on? No. Or do you think that Fukuyama is right, that it's all going to work out fine? I think both are wrong, Huntington and Fukuyama. Uh, Huntington, because of his crazy definition of culture and, and uh, Fukuyama about his Hegelian vision of the future being fine. Look, what we are conf confronted with is on the one hand, a deep population of countries, you know, people don't want to have sex, it seems, and don't want to have children. And on the other hand, you know, you have this possibility of the migrants filling this vacuum. But for some strange reason, uh, some people do not understand the logic of this process. Uh, now, tomorrow, uh, you have uh, the European uh, Council meeting about this issue. And uh, some countries want to stop the influx of people into the EU. You had 2023, you had uh, 1.2 million asylum seekers coming into the EU. And the Italians have now this grandiose idea to send all uh, asylum seekers who have not an approval before they come to Albania into a camp, do there what the Brits tried to do, you know, with Rwanda. Uh, I think both ideas will not work. And I think people have to begin to understand, if, and that's a process that applies to the United States also, that the depopulation of the most advanced industrially Techno technologically uh, countries, not, not only in, in the West, but South Korea and Japan are cases uh, for that same syndrome, that they have to be accepting not only, you know, out of uh, kindness, migrants, but out of need. Uh, all of these societies need migrants wherever they come from in order to keep their social structures uh, working and the economies uh, working as as well. Now you have, in addition to this issue, you have the, the uh, impending um, climate crisis, the collapse, you know, of uh, the uh, ecology uh, will certainly heighten uh, this migrant uh, drive to all of the. Uh, non-threatened uh, parts of the world and the, the parts of the world, you know, that seem to be more affluent, like Europe, like Japan, like the United States or Korea. So you have uh, two major problems that <laughs> we are confronted with. On the one hand, 
the the depopulation uh, of advanced countries. The bell curve that exists in Europe, the bell curve that exists in the United States, uh, the bell curve in, in Japan is probably the best example of it. You made the mention, uh, Manfred, about the you know the need you know migrants needed are needed in in these industrialized countries, even though there is this notion among people in some of those countries that we don't need them, we don't want them because they don't look like us, they don't act like us, so we really don't want them. But at the same time, those places really do need those folks. I mean, even in this country, you know, we're hearing all this noise about the migrants and, you know, they're coming to take your black jobs and your Hispanic jobs, according to at least one of the candidates. Truth of the matter is that, you know, we know that's not true either. There's there are jobs begging you just you just need to go out to a to um a restaurant or to go to any place and and nobody has enough people working yeah. there's there's not enough people working it's just that's kind of like you can see that you don't need a um you don't need a whole stack of statistics to let you know that there are some just work available there's there's and so there's no this notion that we don't want folks coming into the country, whether it's whether it's the United States or whether it's in Western Europe or any of those countries is, is an absurd notion when you really think about it. But it's just, you know, in, in, in politics, you know, we sort of need that so we can keep people down or whatever. I was struck by, I, I'm a sports fan. And so I spent a lot of time watching the Olympics. And so when we talk about these, you know, these countries, we talk about, this whole notion of you know global diversity and and all of that and you had all these countries participating in the Olympics and the Olympic teams of just about every country you know except those countries in you know Africa where all the folks are African but when you looked at places like the Netherlands and France and Italy and Germany all of those countries had diverse teams all of them right every single one of it you, you watch the you know the did you watch the olympic basketball tournaments anybody do i did i watched same thing what does that tell you well it tells you there's a there's a there's a, um, a differentiation between public campaign speaking um public you know political campaigns and the like and and the real world if you look at the United States in the real world, there's an awful lot of diversity. You see it in entertainment. You see it in the schools, for sure. Um, you see it in sports, just as you said. And you know what? If you if you rub shoulders with somebody from a different culture or a different race, you may like that person well enough to marry. And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, I, I, what a concept. <laughs> and, and have children. So we, we have a diverse society, even if Donald Trump doesn't see it. Um, and, and Europe has a diverse society. Uh, what, what about that? Uh, let, me go, let me go back to Manfred just for a moment. Europe had have a diverse society, in fact, de facto, uh, the way the US does. As I mentioned uh, earlier in, in, in sessions that we had, Germany's uh, diversity reaches now the point that the United States had in the 19th century. You know, 17% of Germans have a migrant background. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this background uh, does not simply mean European background. It means African, it means mm -hmm. Asian, uh, especially African. You have to remember that you had more than 2 million black GIs being stationed in Germany from 45 to 90. And a lot of them he got married to white women, uh, and you have then thousands of African students uh, at German universities. Now, it's all West Germany, not East Germany, because the communist country, mm -hmm. you know, you could say are, uh, for reasons that we do not want to talk about today, but one day one should talk about is they're all racist. Uh, you know, they have kept uh, their countries not only behind uh, closed uh, borders, but they didn't travel either. Uh, and they mm -hmm. were not allowed to, to live. I mean, when you have these workers from Angola and uh, Cuba in East Germany, for example, they lived in camps. And when the, uh, when right. the, when the re reunification of Germany happened, they went back 
uh, you know, to Cuba and Angola and other Vietnam, other places. Whereas in Germany, you know, you have this diversity that is uh, quite remarkable. You know, the diaspora phenomenon. You know, in, in the Jewish culture, um, they had to leave um, where they were in the Middle East a long time ago, and they went to Eastern Europe, uh, including Russia, including all the countries of uh, Eastern Europe. They went to Spain. It didn't work out so well in either of those places. But it was a diaspora, and they maintained their ceremonies and their rules of living and family and, and their holidays till now. And they were able to communicate or at least retain their culture that way. But now we have transportation that is almost immediate and available to everyone. We have telecommunications that is immediate and available to everyone. So if I come from Turkey to Germany, uh, something over 80% of the Turks living in Germany watch Turkish TV because it's available. And so mm -hmm. the culture is retained wherever you go. To have the phenomenon of diaspora is way easier today than it was, you know, a thousand years ago, for sure. So my question to you, Tim, is how does this play into the notion of merging the cultures, of bringing the world together? Well, I, I go back to a, a little bit of a historical perspective, and that is in the United States, when we had prop planes and those were converted to jet engines, you had this blossoming of travel uh, of Americans going to foreign countries. Pan Am, TWA, their mission statement was um, to offshore diplomacy to exchange cultures. That was kind of their uh, one of their uh, things that they rested on. That's why you should travel is experience other cultures and share your culture with other cultures. Well, let's fast forward uh, 60 years. And now we have this thing called the, the, the internet, the social media. Um, take a little left turn here. I recently saw Bill Gates being interviewed. And for the first time, I saw Bill Gates admit that he was dead wrong on something. And what he was wrong on, he admitted to, is that he thought the internet and social media was going to be an exchange of truth, that more, more peoples uh, around the world would be exposed to truth, that there'd be more understanding, and therefore less conflicts. He said, I've never been more wrong in my life. He said, what we have is dis disinformation, um, xenophobia, um, racism, and, uh, and the like. And um, I think to a certain degree, uh, I was pleased to see him admit that he was wrong. And, and I think he's correct. So, but we still have the exchange of, of cultures via social, social media. Um, I, I communicate with people from the Middle East, uh, the Far East. Um, in Europe all the time about, you know, cer cer certain subject matters that I'm interested in. I've learned a lot more through social media about someone else's culture than I ever have by traveling to those countries myself. Um, now let's add in the, the hopeful part of exchange of cultures and diversity. And that is, I think, technology. And I've already used it and it helped me greatly when I was in Italy. And that is AI as far as a language translator. My God, the world's okay. going to... The world's going to shrink exponentially once we have an efficient translator that's real time, instantaneous, and uh, can do voice recognition beyond beyond great. And when that happens in the next two to five years, I think that you're going to see a greater exchange of cultures, understanding, and and hopefully um, less conflict in this world. Yeah, let's let's assume that we don't deport everybody in the country in the meantime. In the so meantime, my question got to you. Yeah, we, we got Trump. So on the one hand, you have the possibility of um, kids getting to know other kids. You have the possibility of them marrying and exchanging cultures, having children, um, and, and entering into the, the American culture in terms of entertainment, in terms of uh, capital creation, in, in terms of art and science and all those things. This is the greatest strength the country has. But then you have a guy like Trump who manages to you know, go exactly the other way and focus on de-immigration, de-migration, and bigotry in industrial size, uh, and racism. Um, and so you know, these things are absolutely inapposite. So my question to you, Sandra, is which one is going to prevail against the other? And how long will it take for us to reach a better place? I am an optimist, OK? 
And I am one who really believes in the value of language and cultural exchange. And what Tan was alluding to about having the AI be able to do that, I'm of the school that I think we ought to be learning more languages, learning to speak languages and not just relying on the AI for that, because that's the real exchange. And I and 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 AI is is AI is AI. I'm not gonna even get in that, but um I think it's important though that you know, we understand that I, I still believe that Trump is operating in a small, limited vacuum and appealing to a very limited audience. I think much of our own experiences are so unlike what he is proposing and suggesting. Uh, people in that group tend to be more outspoken and vocal and 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 with regard to that. And I think a lot of people who are interested in you know, having positive cultural exchanges and and uh, engaging in diverse relationships and doing all that, just simply don't choose to engage with those folks. They're on the internet, like you say, Tim, there's, a, you know, there's all that really bad stuff on the internet. And I think enough of us, at least from just my observation, just tend not to engage because they're not real. I mean, they're there, but their influence is limited. And I think we also have a younger generation. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the numbers are anymore, X, Z, Y, which one it is, are significantly smarter than that, with the exception of a few that have kind of got caught up in the cult thing, are much smarter than that and are much more capable of responding to virulent racism, even if it's violent, uh, than my generation was. And in a way that, um, will not allow them to be intimidated or put down because of it. They're not gonna, they're not gonna stand for that. I wanna ask Manfred about violence. Um, you know, Manfred, uh, you, you have the phenomenon of war. Um, you have the phenomenon of disagreement among nations of, of uh, ideologies of cultures. Um, think of the Crusades. Um, and mm -hmm. although, you know, there may be a benefit after the fact, war has a profound effect on what we're talking about. Does war help in some way? Does war destroy the diversity? Uh, where does war take us? Because we've always had wars, and we may have, we do have wars now, and we may have more wars, even bigger wars going forward. So when you when you stir it all up in the pot, especially with regard to Europe and the wars there now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do those how do those how do those things affect um, this this merging of cultures, Manfred? One thing that we have forgotten to mention that this migration debate is certainly framed by white supremacy, uh, mm -hmm. not only in the United States, but in Europe as well, in some countries. Uh, in Germany, I think it's the least, but that may not last forever. But uh, when you think, for example, of Sweden, uh, giving migrants who want to return $30,000 to leave, that has also to do with white supremacy. You know, they don't want to have people who look different. Uh, now, in the United States, I mean, look, the, the 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 Trump campaign is certainly framed in white supremacy. Uh, there's no uh, question about that. You know, where, whenever you hear him talk, uh, I mean, at one point he said, "Why do we get these people from shitholes? Why don't we get them from Norway?" Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> that is not one of the best uh, illustrations of the white supremacy frame in, in the United States. So for that reason, you cannot leave this ideological dimension out of uh, the question, even if I you know, mentioned in, in the beginning that uh, you are confronted here with a kind of schizophrenia. On the one hand, people, societies, advanced societies need migrants to do to keep their social structures functioning. Uh, on the other hand, you know you have these ideological frames that uh, filter uh, people from coming in. But even you know when you don't have that filter, you know when you think of Brexit, for example, Brexit was not motivated by people coming from Africa and Asia. People, uh, it it was the resentment of people coming from within the European Union and staying in Great Britain. I mean, the Brits have now realized they made a big mistake. 57% uh, 
uh, would like to undo the Brexit. Not that will not happen, but I mean, you have there this idiotic uh, result in, in in Great Britain, and you may have that. Uh, you know, well, if you look at Hungary, Orban, you know, is another uh, ideologue uh, who is blocking uh, the EU. You know, again and again, the only power they have because they cannot kick him in Hungary out of the EU because they need unanimity. Uh, so the only power they have is the power of the purse. Hungary needs 200 uh, million euros uh, and the EU refuses to pay them <laughs> that money that they normally would have received. So mm -hmm. we are talking about, you know, the cultural uh, setting. Uh, it is not only race, it is also, you know, um, a racial definition of Christianity, for example. And for me, you know, I, I once wrote a piece about it. One of the most fascinating things about German Middle Evil culture is you have, you have in paintings, in sculptures, when you are looking at the three wise men, you have always three figures, a European, one who looks like uh, a Palestinian, and then an African. But this African in these, de uh, in these depictions, even in the sculptures, are not um, colorized Europeans. They are Africans in a way that is quite stunning. You know, when you go through German museums and churches, you will find that. That ends, that ends in 15 in the 16th century, 1519, you, in Munich, you know, in, in, in the muse, in the Alte Pinakothek, there is a stunning picture hanging by Grunewald um, from 15 in the 1520s, where you have two uh, uh, sacred people, saints, standing each to, next to each other. One is white, and the other is African, and the African mm -hmm. is Mauritius. Uh, now, that depiction of equality vanishes when in, right. the, in the 16th century, you know, Africans become uh, transported from Africa to uh, southern, uh, the southern part of the continent. Africans become suddenly slaves, and they were not slaves. And the depiction in these, uh, in these pictures and these sculptures uh, before... They were equal. Albrecht Dürer that uh, describes that. I mean, it's really fascinating. I, I'm, I'm agreeing. I think he has a point because there is a there is a point. And I'm not sure of the exact point in history. Certainly, certainly the uh, uh, slavery had a lot to do with it. But that whole notion of rewriting that history and rewriting that depictions of you know who was involved in you know the establishment of you know Christianity or, or whatever the religions were I, at that time that was not. It was not racially based. I mean, well, that wasn't even a concept. Race is something that we've created here. Oh, um, that is so interesting. We well, made you know, that up. We, are, we made yes, up race. So often the case, you know, it's like Belgium and Rwanda. Those people didn't hate each other, but mm -hmm. Belgium created a division. And if you create a division, strange the first things. Time I, first time I encountered thinking about race and ethnicity was when I, this was many years ago and I was, had a pastor, we were going to uh, somewhere in Europe, someplace where they ask you what your, eth what your ethnicity is. I didn't know what my ethnicity is. Black is not an ethnicity. Right. It's not. Then you go to like a place like Cuba, so we went, went went to to you know to Cuba and there of course you know there um you know people are of different colorations in 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 Cuba but when you talk and I and I had this discussion I've had it in Cuba I had it in Argentina I've had it in several countries you know where there are people who are dark skin and what they say is like I'm Cuban I'm Argentinian I'm Brazil I'm Brazilian they don't say I'm black Brazilian. We made that up. And so when he's talking about those sculptures and paintings in which, you know, Africans are depicted in those times prior to that, um, that's actually true. We made this stuff up. 
I'm wondering if this is a, a phenomenon that emanated out of the United States, out of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you have is a, is a, a, a non-racist society, uh, at least in terms of the art and what we can learn from the art uh, in Europe. And then we get slavery going on. And at that time, what, 1619 and all that, um, all of a sudden we have slavery and the slavery affects the world view of racism. You've got to dehumanize the people in order to justify its existence. Really, this is a sort of sad and ironic point that uh, the U.S. created this phenomenon. No, 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 no. Uh, no, wait, 1519 is Spain. Spain and Portugal uh, advanced 100 years before the United, before England. So it's England, uh, you know, that introduces uh, slavery, African slavery into what is today the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States didn't exist in 1619. So what you have to talk about is the Spanish and the Portuguese monarchy and then the British monarchy. So these three monarchies are responsible for uh, dehumanizing. And it all happened with regard to America, whatever the p political arrangement was. So Tim, you know, we are, we have been the city on the hill. We have been the moral leader, you know, imperfectly perhaps but we have been the moral leader for the world. And I wonder where, where this is going because very clearly what we have now is an example of racism, a, mm, an emphasis on racism as part of our national culture. And it's, it shows in this election, uh, perhaps more than it did before, although it did show before, look back. The question I put to you, Tim, is, is this. Um, if, we, if we change things, um, then perhaps we're still the city on the hill. We're the leader. Um, if we, if if Trump wins, and we have an exacerbation of racism and bigotry around the country, which we have had with him, um, that affects Europe. It affects other places. I mean, this thing spreads from one culture to another, from one geography to another. If Trump loses. And Kamala Harris, you know, demonstrates that the city on the hill has has moral suasion. It has moral purity. Um, it it is distancing itself from racism and bigotry and the like. Uh, so, how important is this election in those terms? Will it have an effect not only on the U.S. but on other places in the world? Oh, I think it'll have a huge impact, and I think the genesis of that change will be the education system, depending on which which administration wins out here in this election. If it's the Donald Trump administration, you'll see a complete whitewashing of history. You'll you'll forget those stories of Wounded Knee. You'll forget those stories of uh, the massacre in um, Kansas. Um, you'll forget all these atrocities that impacted um, you know a diverse population. And it'll be whitewashed. Uh, Call it banning of books. Call it a curriculum that will not be taught because it was un, uh, not favorable for to white Americans. Um, that will occur, and I think if the Harris campaign works wins out, I think you'll see uh, an effort from the Department of Education to be more inclusive of of education of our past, our true past. And it's painful. It's painful uh, for white Americans to listen to. But it's necessary because if you just buy off on the fact that, you know, uh, no one was there was no genocide of the American Native uh, Indians, um, you're, you're, you're living in, in, a, in a false narrative and you can never advance if you're living in a false narrative and, and denying your true history. Uh, I'll give an example. I mean, Japan to this day has a hard time reconciling with what happened in World War II. Um, it's just the way the culture is. And, it's they're slowly making amends. They're slowly coming forward. Germany, Germany has done an excellent job with that. I mean, unbelievably progress. And I'd say they came to the party and, and they know who they are and where they're going. Um, we will not advance as a nation. And it's certainly what we export as far as racism will never advance until we reconcile with our true history and, and, and learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. Manfred, is it too late? Is it too late for the United States to show the way on diversity? 
Well, no, the United States will not show the way. <laughs> it was never the city upon the hill. I mean, that's American self-interpretation. Uh, but I think the more uh, the United States recognizes its past, you know, the, the genocidal policies toward the native people and uh, the 1619 deadline, you know, the discrimination of Africans has been part of uh, the American story for over 400 years and became consolidated by the Constitution. And even after the Civil War, you know, when you have the amendments, uh, one had to wait another, Blacks had to wait another 100 years, you know, for uh, the equal rights that were uh, that Congress passed, but it was vetoed, you know, by the president at that time. We had to wait until the 1960s. 60s. So for that reason, uh, it's a process ongoing, but don't think the United States will become a model for the rest of the world. Uh, and I don't think... Uh, uh, Is the rest of the world leaving us behind? No, 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 no. I think it is a it's a process that of consciousness transformation that it will affect certainly the West, but it will also have to be. Tim mentioned Japan. You know, its unwillingness to come to terms with its uh, violent past. You know, when you when you go to China and go to museums there, it's absolutely stunning. You know, the violence that is. Uh, registered the violence of the Japanese against uh, uh, the, the Chinese. And the, the Japanese political class doesn't want to accept that reality. The intellectuals do. Um, I mean, whenever I talk with people in Japan about that, you know, that issue, they would accept it. But let me, let me give you a, a somewhat ironic uh, <laughs> illustration of this talk that okay, we're, we're going to take this as your closing remarks because we're almost okay. out of time. I was asked, I asked a, an Indonesian anthropologist uh, once when uh, racism uh, really became an, an issue in in Indonesia and when people began to be called yellow. And she said to me, you know, it's very funny that you asked the question. But uh, we never thought of ourselves as yellow people. It comes into this language becomes into comes into being at the end of the 18th century, when the Dutch women became upset about the appeal of these very beautiful and attractive Indonesian girls and women, and so they started calling them yellow in order to make them look in the eyes of uh, the Dutch men, the colonizers, as inferior. Uh, and that's how this language of uh, yellow, you know, for not only Indonesians, but for other uh, Asian substance being. Now, when you're looking at the <laughs> Japanese and Chinese, they're all white. I mean, their skin color, you know, is not different from, from Europeans, you know, and it's always fascinating when you when you see that. So you have to, I mean, this color business has become part, you know, of this strange hierarchy of so-called races uh, that was uh, in introduced by European philosophers. Sadly to say, Manuel Kant was one of them. David Hume was another one. Uh, and, you know, the darker your skin color was, the lower, you know, your rank was in this hierarchy of races. All of this, I think, has to be uh, put in the ideological garbage can. Uh, you know, it has to become uh, removed okay. from our vocabulary. You know, we have to cleanse uh, our languages. Very good point. Uh, Sandra, you know, we have, we have race, we have culture. And in a perfect world, a Francis Fukuyama world, it's all merged together in a big salad. And everybody, um, you know, tolerates everybody else. But the question is, assuming, you know, we decolorize our world, uh, and it'd be a wonderful thing, 
Um, should we deculture our world also? Uh, should the cultures that contributed to a sort of a global diversity, should they continue or should they likewise be decultured? Well, it depends on what you're defining as culture. Uh, from place to place, it's what is what is American culture? What is our culture? I mean, that's a good, you know, it's a good point to start. When we talk about American culture, what are we talking about? Are we talking about our 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 music? Are we talking about our food? Are we talking about ideals? Are we talking about um, what is it? Okay, good question. Good question. And, and I'll, I'll give you an answer. Sort of, it was it's sort of a joke, or well, maybe it's not a joke. But a few years ago, my son gave me a T-shirt. Got it in Chicago, and you know, we you know, like I said, we love being American. We love the things that we call our culture. And he says the shirt says, "Everything you love about America is because of black people." <laughs> you like jazz? I agree. <laughs> hey. You know, <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> you can what expand that to I mean, everything you love about America is 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 the immigrants. You know, it's a nation I, of immigrants. Yeah. Can I tag on to what she just said? What Sandra just said? Yes. America has been known for years as the great melting pot. That's that's a false narrative. It's really a toss salad of unique yep. cultures that need to preserve themselves as a unique culture. And, uh, and through, through the combination of these unique cultures, we become a great nation. Let's not melt into a melting pot just because uh, white America wants to get along. <laughs> Let's keep our, 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 our differences and add to the flavor of America. Do you want to change your testimony, Sandra? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 he's you no, know, he's right. But it's also, I think that you know, recognizing that even when you're doing any sort of a, amalgamation, that you recognize the origin of what that means. Mm -hmm. I mean, jazz is a good example. I mean, is it is, it is entirely, ex, you know, and it's it's entirely a black music form. But it's international now. Yep. And you, you know, well, that's a whole different. That's another discussion. You know where jazz and jazz is actually more popular in 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 Europe and in other countries than it is here in this country. Oh, sure. I mean, yes. jazz, jazz, real jazz. Right? Yes. Well, Sandra, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave with our viewers? I find this discussion quite fascinating, particularly in the context of the election that we're going through. I, I, I I'm wanting to remain hopeful. I think um, our I don't want to say if it's innate intelligence, but I think our will to be people who are kind, compassionate, understanding, and tolerant can prevail. I do. An American enlightenment, if you will, such as we tried to have in the 18th century, but that was a long time ago. Go ahead. I think we'll yeah. be all right. Okay. All right. Maybe. 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 <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Jim, you want to try to summarize all of this and give us your wisdom? Not summarize, though. It's too much. I can't do it. Uh, but I'll give you my last thoughts. You know, the fight against racism, the fight against xenophobia um, is not, we've made great progress, but it's not always a forward progression or a, or a linear progression. I think Barack Obama said well to this in a speech he, he gave uh, in his last year of being president of the United States, and that was, Sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes advancement or, or being to pr progress forward is three steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. And you have to be patient, unfortunately, with the one step back. But if you can collect your thoughts and remember your history and remind your younger generations of their history, you could advance beyond that one step back and make three steps again forward. And over time, that's how you slowly, you know, make progression and, and advancement in the in the human condition. Yeah. And certainly the human mentality. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think if you look at history on a longer term basis, you had, you know, uh, you had an advancement of the Roman Empire. Then you lost it all. You lost it through education. We called that the Dark Ages. And then the Dark Ages went for, you know, thousands of years or excuse me, hundreds of years. And then you had the Renaissance. Well, look where we've come since the Renaissance. 
Uh, there's been progression, and then there's been setbacks. And certainly in this nation, um, you know, in 1620s, uh, actually the Pilgrims got along with the Wanapogs pretty well for about 50 years. Uh, there was a co cooperation and, uh, if you will, sometimes a friendship. And the kids, grandkids forgot about that. And uh, lo and behold, in 1775, you have the King Philip uh, War that uh, the Native Americans said, we're being treated horribly and we're going to push you off this continent. Uh, so again, it's it's progress and then three steps back and hopefully hopefully education and history will just keep things moving in a progressive linear manner. But that's not usually the case. Well, not for Hawaii. Hawaii is the salad. Hawaii can show the world and teach the world so much about this. And we, we live in it. Sometimes we forget, you know, we, we might get um, troubled about one issue or another. But the fact is, this is, in, in terms of our diversity discussion, this is nirvana. Well, thank you, Sandra. Thank you for coming around. Really appreciate it, Sandra Sims thank and Manfred Henningsen. Thank you for sharing your manau with us. And, and Tim, thank you for your thoughts, as always, as co-host. Aloha, you guys. Aloha. 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 That was fun. <laughs>